Can you hear me? I'm trying to. It's live on YouTube. Don't want a Joe Biden moment. All right. You're going to be live on YouTube, so you better behave. We good? Good afternoon, my name is Alex Padilla. I'm the director of the Exploring Economic Freedom Project. Uh, today I'm very excited because our speakers are Abby Hall. She's the JIN PhD Fellow in Economics and a dissertation fellow at the Mercury Center at George Mason University. She's a PhD fellow with the Institute for Human Studies and a PhD candidate at George Mason University in Fairfax, Virginia. She graduated with a BA in Economics and Business Administration with a concentration in Mathematics from Bellarmine University in Louisville, Kentucky. Her works include issues surrounding the US military and national defense, including domestic police militarizations, arms sales, weapons as foreign aid, and the political economy of military technology. Her dissertation is entitled The Political Economy of Drones, where she examines the interplay between private and public actors in the evolution, development, and use of unmanned aerial vehicles, or drones, for, by the US military. Her work illustrates how the incentive faced by various private and public actors work to influence decisions regarding national defense policy. She has published many articles in academic journals, such as Public Choice, Atlantic Economic Journal, The Independent Review, Defense, and Peace Economics. Abiol is going to talk to us today about the US militarization of police, and more exactly, she's going to focus on the political economy and the mechanism that has led to the militarization of US police. Please welcome Abiol. So do I need a hand mic, or can I? Do I need a hand mic? Well, thank you all for having me. I'd like to thank Dr. Padilla and Metro State for hosting me today. Uh, I think that the program that they are putting on here is fantastic, and I strongly encourage you all to attend some of the upcoming lectures that you all have next semester. I had the chance to talk to Alex about them a little bit at dinner last night, and it sounds like you all have a great lineup coming up. Um, as Alex said, my research is really focusing at the intersection of economics and politics. And my main body of research right now is actually about the use of drones by the US military and the policy implications of that. But that topic was actually sparked by what I'm going to talk to you about today, which is this idea of domestic police militarization. So the title of the talk that I'm giving you today is From Protect and Serve, which you may recognize, and we'll talk a little bit about where that comes from later. From Protect and Serve, to comply or die. And it's looking at this phenomenon of militarized police in the United States. So with that, I'm gonna start with a little bit of an introduction. They say that a picture is worth a thousand words. And I have a few pictures for you to kind of illustrate exactly what it is that I'm talking about. So if you look up here on the PowerPoint, we have some, some guys looking a little like military, wouldn't you think? So what, what do we have going on here? We've got camouflage, we have bulletproof vest, Kevlar helmets, we have uh, assault weapons. But you can see from the guy or the gentleman up in the forefront, or in the foreground, excuse me, he doesn't have any kind of US military insignia written on his vest. It clearly says sheriff. This is not some place where the US military is currently engaging in operations. This is in Ferguson, Missouri. 
a couple of months ago, which you all may be familiar with and probably are familiar with. Here we have another picture, also from Ferguson, Missouri, and we're seeing more of the same. Bulletproof vests, Kevlar helmets, camouflage, combat boots, assault weapons, and these guys are even, uh, they're donning full, uh, full face masks. Ferguson was a really great example for me to use at the beginning of this PowerPoint for all the wrong reasons. Um, here we have police working to dismantle camera equipment. So now we're getting into issues of freedom of the press. The police did not want the camera crews in a particular location. They told them they did not. And so how did the police respond? They launched tear gas into the location where the media had set up shop in order to get them to vacate the area. Afterwards, they proceeded to dismantle the camera equipment. Now, the issues in Ferguson have really brought this issue of police militarization kind of up to the forefront. And it's a lot of people are now talking about it after the shooting of Michael Brown. How has this happened? Why is this small police department um, engaging in all these activities? But what surprises me is that people didn't connect Ferguson to something that had actually happened a year earlier which, if you ask me, actually may trump what happened in Ferguson. And that is what happened in Watertown, Massachusetts, after the bombing of the Boston Marathon, where, if you remember, uh, two terrorists placed uh, pressure cooker bombs at the finish line of the Boston Marathon, and afterwards, the police went looking for them. And in searching for one of the suspects, they essentially shut down the entire town of Watertown, Massachusetts, including sending in, as you can see here, a variety of teams dressed in full military regalia, uh, riding in on heavily armored vehicles. And they also imposed a curfew, meaning that people couldn't actually leave their homes when they wanted to. They were, conf they were supposed to be confined to their living space. It also included what I have a picture of here, which is uh, illegal home searches. So not only did you have people who were now confined to their house and unable to leave, but then police were coming into their homes without any kind of probable cause to uh, engage in searches for this terror suspect, even if they had absolutely no evidence that this person was actually there. And these aren't the only examples. So there are a lot of them, and you can Google them and find probably as many as you would want. But I've got another one up here. This is coming from uh, Paragold, Arkansas, where the police chief uh, deployed SWAT teams with the order to have anyone who appeared in public present identification. And just a quick note, the town only has 27,000 people in it. But if you are out in public, you're going to be required to present ID. Now, the police chief came out and said some controversial remarks about why he thought he had the right to do this, and the mayor backed him up. So the quote that I have here is, they may not be doing anything but walking their dog, but they're going to have to prove it. So this is the question that I really want us to focus in on today. It's what I have back here. On the left-hand side, you see something like, uh, and I don't know for a, I know a lot of you all are students. If you ask your parents or your grandparents what police were like when they were a lot younger, they will probably tell you something radically different than what we have experienced and what people of a slightly younger generation have experienced. So it used to be that if you were a 12 or 13 year old punk kid and you went out and were engaging in stupid behavior as 12 and 13 year old punk kids do, um, what would the police do if they caught you? Throw you in the back of the car, drag you by the ear to your parents' door, knock on it, and they say, hey, little Jimmy here is causing trouble. Fix it. And that's how it got dealt with. Now what happens if you're a 12 or 13-year-old punk kid and you're out engaging in stupid behavior and the police catch you? They don't take you home to your mom. They arrest you, they book you, you're put into the system. This is a radically different type of policing activity than what has historically been experienced in the United States. So today what we're going to look at is not just the fact that we've seen this militarization, but what we really want to ask is why? 
and how has this taken place? And in order to do that, we're going to use some tools from economics to build ourselves a framework so that we can understand this progressive militarization of police. So to kind of give you an idea of where we're going from here so we're not just uh, going in the dark, um, we're going to talk a little bit deeper about a broader puzzle known as the paradox of government, or as I have here, the paradox of power. We're going to look at militarization and the types of militarization, talk about which one we've seen in the United States and what that looks like. And then we're going to broadly get the tools that we're going to need to be able to explain militarization in the US. So we're going to talk about the role of crisis, and we're going to talk about what is known as the economics of bureaucracy. And then after we have those tools, then we're going to be able to apply this to the idea of militarized police. And we're going to be able to examine how it is we get from the, going back to the previous slide, going from the guys on your left to the guys on your right. Talk about the war on drugs and the war on terror and the role that those have played in police militarization. And then after that, we'll finish up and I'll open it up for questions. So with that, let's move on and talk about the the puzzle of government power, also known as the paradox of government. So this paradox that I'm talking about actually has its roots back in antiquity. I won't try to pronounce the Latin because I will botch it, um, but if you translate it into modern English, the question is, who will watch the watchers? Or who will guard the guardians? Now, what do they mean by that? Because that might be a little bit esoteric. Well, this is the puzzle that they're talking about. In order for the government to do certain things, in this case, provide police protection or provide security, individuals have to give up particular freedoms. They have to give up certain rights to allow the government to function and do the kinds of things that we might want the government to do. However, this presents us with a bit of a problem. Because while we have to grant the government authority to do certain things, we have to simultaneously trust them to not abuse the power that they've been given. So you can see where this might present a little bit of a problem, is we appoint these people, or we appoint the government over us to protect us, and yet there's nobody who is providing them necessarily direct supervision in the way that we would think about direct supervision. Now, when you empower the government, in this case again, to provide security, you can have two outcomes. First, the government force on monopoly, or the government monopoly on force, excuse me. This monopoly can be used in a protective way. So it can be used to protect individuals, to protect private property rights, to uphold the values of the citizenry. In contrast, though, it can also be used to undermine the very liberties that they are tasked with protecting. So in the first case, we would refer to the state as being protective. And in the second case, we would refer to the state as being predatory. So the question, and the really the big question that is kind of at the heart of what we're looking at specifically today, is how do you empower the government while simultaneously constraining it? In particular, what we want to look at is what happens when you have a protective state that moves from being protective to being predatory. Now historically there's been a distinction between police and military. So police are seen as domestic peacekeepers. Their jobs are to uphold the law and to protect the rights of all of the citizens, both guilty and innocent. So you don't historically see a cop with a grenade launcher looking to like take out you know, a drug dealer on the corner. It's not typically what you think of when you think of police officers. They're supposed to protect people, uphold the laws of their community. Military, on the other hand, has a completely different function. So their function is specifically to go out and to combat external threats. So they're supposed to be protecting larger US interests abroad. Now we can see this distinction really clearly by just looking at a couple of different mottos. So if we look at the motto for the LAPD or the Los Angeles Police Department, 
which probably I'd say most people are familiar with, their motto is to protect and serve. Now we can talk about whether or not the LAPD actually um, And we can contrast this to the US Soldier's Creed, which states, I stand for deploy, engage, and destroy the enemies of the United States in close combat. But as we saw from the pictures at the beginning, it's not necessarily clear that um, the police are maintaining this idea of protecting and serving and may seem to be moving, or have moved, I should say, toward this idea of combating an enemy. So let's put militarization in perspective a little bit. So I have here some statistics which are looking at uh, SWAT teams. So we can talk about militarization in a few different ways and how we might go about measuring it, but one way that's particularly effective is to look at SWAT teams. So SWAT teams stand for Special Weapons and Tactics Team. The first SWAT team was actually referred to as the Special Weapons Attack Team, but it was thought that attack was a little bit too strong, so they pulled the wording back a little bit. It's also known as paramilitary units or PPUs. So if we look at the prevalence of PPUs or SWAT teams over time, we can get an idea of how police departments, or how many police departments at least, are adopting these military style uh, characteristics. So if you look at what I have up here, it's broken down by city size. So in the top left, we have the number of cities between, with a population between 25 and 50,000 people who has a SWAT team. In 1984, 26%. In 2005, this had jumped up to 80%. And if we look at towns with a population greater than 50,000 people, in the early 1990s, it was about 59%, up to 89%. Uh, by the mid-90s, this had increased to 89%. If you look at the right-hand side, you can see the approximate number of SWAT teams in the United States. And as you can see, between the early 90s, this is even more impressive when you think about when SWAT teams actually started. So the first SWAT team actually was not created until the mid-1960s out in Los Angeles. So within this very brief period of time, and in particular, you might not be able to see it completely with these graphics, but really starting in the late 1970s and in the early 1980s, you start to have this explosion of SWAT teams. I should mention, however, that it's not just state and local police departments who have SWAT teams. So there are also some very interesting federal groups that have their own SWAT teams. This includes uh, the US Fish and Wildlife Service. That's a new kind of fishing, not one I'm familiar with. NASA has a SWAT team. The jokes for these like really write themselves. Um, the Department of Education. Both of my parents are teachers and I know that like elementary school kids can be crazy but a SWAT team seems a little excessive. Uh, the US National Park Service and the US FDA or the Food and Drug Administration. So now we're gonna start talking a little bit about the political economy of militarization. And again, we're going to talk a little bit more specifically about militarization and what we mean, and then we're gonna get the tools to apply what we've seen to this particular case of militarization in the United States. So we can think about two types of militarization, broadly speaking. The first would be direct militarization, and this is where you have the military who is being used as a civil law enforcement force. So the government sends out the military to enforce its domestic laws. So we can think of lots of examples of countries around the world where this is the case. Uh, Syria is probably a good and relevant case uh, to point out at the present time. And then we also have indirect police militarization. And this is the one that we've really seen in the US and the one that we're going to be explaining with our framework. And this is where you have police forces who are acquiring military characteristics over time. So this can be the structure that the police departments take on, so they may adopt military structure, they may adopt military type characteristics or tactics, and also what we'll talk about a little bit later on is police acquiring military-like 
weapons and the incentives that that creates. Ideally, effective constraints are going to prevent both of these types of militarization from occurring. But as we've seen with our example so far, it appears that whatever constraints have been put in place have not been particularly affected. Or uh, and a better way of saying that is these constraints, um, even if present in theory, have eroded over time. So now let's talk about the role of crisis and get an idea of the tools that we're going to use to explain the rise or the increase in the militarization of police. So some of this stuff can get a little technical, but I'm going to try to keep it as, as simple as possible, but I think it's fairly straightforward. So let's talk about crisis for a moment and the role of crisis in the expansion of government in general. When, you experience, when the nation, in this case the US, experiences a crisis, there's a certain pattern of things that tend to occur. So there is some kind of crisis. Now this crisis can be real. So you could have something like September 11th, you could have a terrorist attack on US soil. That would be like a real crisis. It can also be perceived. So if people think it's going to be a crisis, then this can also work. So if you think that wild turkeys are going to get really mad about Thanksgiving and they're going to overrun the United States next month, and people are genuinely concerned about the wild turkeys, then this can also be a crisis situation. So you have a crisis, and then what happens next? There is this public outcry for the government to do something to combat this crisis whether it is amping up terrorist counterterrorism efforts after 9-11, whether it's sending a bunch of hunters out to combat the supposed wild turkey uh, invasion. There is this knee-jerk reaction among the broader population for the government to do something. And in response to this, what does the government do? Something. And it does a lot of something. So what we see in response to the crisis is that the government uh, bumps up its activities in order to combat the crisis. Now at some point, the crisis ends. So after September 11th, after a period of time, people calm down a little bit. Once November comes and goes and people find out that the wild turkeys are not going to invade the US, people stop panicking about wild turkeys, and the government drops its level of activity back down, which is what we refer to as retrenchment. Now, the trick about this retrenchment point, or the government bringing its level of activity back down, is that while it decreases its activity, it doesn't quite decrease it back to its original point. So let me try to put this a different way. So this idea is what's referred to as the ratchet effect, and it was uh, formulated by an economist named uh, Robert Higgs, who is now with the Independent Institute. And this is really what we're looking at. So on our x-axis, we have time. And on our y-axis, we've got the size of government. And we've got a projected growth of what our government is going to look like. So our original projection is the line A to F prime, or the A with the, or the F, excuse me, with the, with the dash on it. So that's our original projection of what the government is going to look like. So then we start moving along our x-axis, or time is elapsing. Now if we get to point B, what's happening there? That's a crisis. Remember what happened on the last slide. People freak out. They want the government to do something. So in response, what happens? We jump up from point B to point C. This is the government reacting, responding to people, wanting them to do something to combat this crisis. We continue on, and then we get to point D. People calm down a little bit. And then we start to experience that idea of retrenchment. So the government contracts its activities. So what happened? Our new projected growth rate for government is now higher than it was before. So keep this in the back of your mind, because we're going to be using this idea to explain how it is that our police and the police, police activity has become militarized and has increased over time. 
The other piece of this puzzle that we need before we can really dive into the specific case is what's known as the economics of bureaucracy. So one of the things that we typically think about and that we learn in, uh, again, I know a lot of you all are students that you learn in like principles of economics classes, is the idea of profit. That businesses, private businesses, seek out profit opportunities. If they earn a positive profit, that tells them that they're doing something right, they're doing a good thing, and they need to keep going. If they earn a loss or a negative profit, that tells them the opposite. They're doing something wrong, they need to, they need to correct. But bureaus or bureaucracies, so this would be groups like the Department of Defense and the military, and state and local police forces, they don't respond to those same incentives, those same uh, profit and loss mechanisms as for-profit businesses. They have a different set of incentives and different mechanisms that they use for growing and expanding their, their reach and their, their power. In particular, bureaus, so again, when I say bureau, in this context, think about state and local police and the military, they have an incentive to do a couple of things. First thing that they want to do is they want to expand their budget. They want to make that discretionary budget as big as possible. Think about what would happen if you were a, uh, let's say you were a member of the military and you went to your commanding officer and you said, hey, I think I could save, um, I think I could save our unit, whatever we want that to be, I think I could save us like a million dollars a year. What does that commander have an incentive to do? Is he going to go up the chain and say, hey, we could save like a million dollars a year here? No, I see a few people shaking their heads. Why is that the case? Because he goes up the chain of command and says, hey, we can save a million dollars a year, what's going to happen to his budget? It's gonna get cut by a million dollars a year, because they're going to say, oh, well, great, you can do the exact same thing that you're doing with less money, fantastic. So we have this incentive then to increase our budget, and we also have an incentive to increase the number of subordinates or the number of uh, support staff that we have at our command. So if we put these two things into, this leads to what uh, economists and political scientists refer to as mission creep where you have a original mission or an original mandate for a particular group. So again, think police. Their original function is to do what? To protect and serve the rights of domestic citizens. But in an effort to increase their budget and in to increase their number of personnel, what might they do? They might try to expand the activities that they're engaging in in order to increase their budget and increase their number of personnel. So if you are a police organization, for example, and you recognize that the government really values counterterrorism and counter drug, counter, uh, and like counter narcotics efforts, then you might try to take on those activities as what you do on a day-to-day -day basis in order to draw more resources from the federal government. And we see the same thing working on the uh, on the military side as well. All right, so hopefully that wasn't too painful, and now we've got the pieces together. This idea of uh, mission creep, and the economics of bureaucracy, and the economics of crisis. We have these pieces, and now we're going to put them together to explain how it is that we've seen this trend in the militarization of police. And in particular, what we're going to be focusing in on are two very important long-term events in U.S. history, and this would be the War on Drugs and the War on Terror. Now before that, I mentioned earlier that there have been some attempts and that ideally what we want to do is to constrain the government so that we don't have to be talking about these issues in the first place. And this was something that had been recognized this issue of militarized police. In fact, the, uh, the earliest, some of the earliest documents, including the Constitution, they're very specific about separating powers from the federal government and state powers. And these have been added to over time, or they were added to over time, in terms of trying to make a very clear distinction between police functions and military functions. So in 1788, you have legislation that's passed that says that a 
the military, or a state, excuse me, must obtain congressional permission to use the military to enforce civil laws. And it places strict limits on the use and length of time that federal forces could be employed by a state authority. So what the government at this point is saying is, well, okay, maybe sometimes we might need to use the military domestically, but we don't want that to be something that happens all the time. So we're going to place very strict limits on it. Now the next thing that we come to, and this is probably the most important in the historical attempts to, again, separate police and the military, is an act that was passed in 1876, which is referred to as the Posse Comitatus Act. Posse Comitatus stands for, or it means, a quote-unquote force of the people. So what this act did was to effectively try to prohibit the use of the military as a posse comitatus or a force of the people. This originated after some events that occurred following the Civil War during Civil War Reconstruction. What had happened was the military was accused in several southern states of preventing voters from exercising their right to vote. They were saying that the military had gone to the polling places, they were intimidating voters, and they wanted to make sure that that kind of thing wouldn't happen again. And so they passed this act. Now the act allowed some exceptions so that you, the governors of certain states could request certain assistance. And then they later extended this act as the military grew and uh, had different branches. So it's extended to include the Air Force, the Navy, and the Marines. The only thing that was exempt from this were the National and the Coast Guard units and they were exempted as long as they remained under state control. We'll come back to that in a minute. So while this act is in place, we start to see pretty much from the very beginning that this act is being violated uh, all over the place. So the original act, if we remember, 1876, come to uh, 1878, so two years later, the military deploys troops to the Western territories in the United States under the pretense that they're not actually states, and so posse comitatus doesn't apply, so they're deployed. We bring this forward a little bit. Uh, during World War I, the Posse Comitatus Act is suspended to allow the military to act domestically. The idea was that National Guard troops and Coast Guard troops were being deployed abroad to Europe and to the South Pacific, and so they wanted to be able to use the military to enforce things domestically. And then Posse Comitatus goes, uh, goes, kind of, goes kind of quiet. And you don't really see anything about it popping up until you hit the 1970s. And then Posse Comitatus comes up in several high-profile legal cases, and these really put the nail in the coffin of the Posse Comitatus Act. So if it was effective before, not gonna be effective anymore after the 1970s. So what did these cases do and what was going on? There was a, a group of Native Americans who had um, set up in opposition to the government uh, out in one of the western states. It's escaping me at the moment. But, sorry? South Dakota, I think. Yeah. So, thank you. Thank you. So, you have this Native American group who is now set up in opposition to the government, and the government sends in then military forces to try to break this stalemate between this group, of, this tribe. Yes. American Indian Movement. Thank you. The AIM movement. Um, it's right there. I just couldn't get it. Thank you. So you have the government who then goes in to try to counteract the AIM movement. And what happens as a result is that when the, when the members of this group are then brought to trial, they pull out the Posse Comitatus Act to say, can't do that. You use the military as a domestic law enforcement agency, and so you can't convict us. So then we wind up with a series of legal rulings that go up to various appellate courts in the Supreme Court which are really redefining the application and the scope of this law. So in particular, there are three. So one ruling found that the act only applies when military forces play a quote-unquote active role 
And you can kind of see how this terminology is automatically problematic because active is particularly fuzzy. I'm not exactly sure what active means and doesn't mean. Second ruling says that military forces can act so long as their activities are not pervasive. Again, we see this term is a little bit fuzzy. Now I gotta figure out what active means and I gotta figure out what pervasive means and I don't really know what either of those mean. And then the last one, which is the big one, the military can act as long as it's not acting in a quote, regulatory, prescriptive, or compulsory manner. So now we've got lots, now it's just really fuzzy. So now it, it's fuzz all over the place. So you can't use the military now to act as a civilian law enforcement agency unless it, it, it can, as long as it's not playing an active role, its activities aren't pervasive, and as long as it's not acting in a regulatory, prescriptive, or compulsory manner. Well, as we can see, the, there are apparently a lot of things that fall under these particular exceptions. So this kind of sets our groundwork, if you will, this erosion of this act for what we start seeing in the 1970s and onward with the acceleration of police militarization. So we saw with uh, World War I and with what was going on in the 1970s and earlier out west, this use of the military as a civilian police force and this kind of blending, if you will, of those two roles. But then we come to the late 70s, 80s, 90s, and, and today. And what, what's different about this? We start to see the war on drugs and the war on terror. Now, think about the difference, if you will, between something like the war on drugs or the war on terror and a conflict like Vietnam, Korea, or World War II. In these earlier events, what do you have? You have a very clearly defined external enemy who you are fighting. What do you have going on in the war on drugs and war on terror? You certainly have an international component. So you have Pablo Escobar in Colombia and other drug lords in South America. You want to bust down the cartels. Talk about the war on terror, Saddam Hussein, uh, Al-Qaeda, now ISIS. There's an external component. But also very important, and what's missing from these previous conflicts is a very internal component. So now when you're talking about the war on drugs and the war on terror, it's not just people over there who you are fighting against. You now have a very big internal problem. So with the war on drugs, it's not just the cartels. It's the people who are using drugs, selling drugs, manufacturing drugs. With the war on terrorism, now you have this big issue of homegrown terror. So they just had a, an attack in Canada on military personnel. And now there's this big talk about homegrown terror. Uh, I think the guy in New York with a hatchet like attacked a couple of police officers. Again, this emphasis on homegrown terror. And this is going to be particularly important. So here I've got a quote from Attorney General Eric Holder, who's talking about this very specific issue with domestic terrorists. So he says, homegrown terrorists are what keeps me up at night. You didn't worry about this even two years ago, about individuals, Americans, to the extent that we do now. And that is of great concern. The threat has changed from simply worrying about foreigners coming here to worrying about people in the United States, American citizens. So this is particularly important, this domestic component. So link this back to what we discussed earlier about ISIS. So what happens with the war on terror and the war on terror? They're viewed as significant crises. Now we can debate about whether or not they are a real crisis or a perceived crisis, perhaps a little bit of, of both. But the crisis opportunities presented by the war on drugs and the war on terror allowed a great opportunity, if you will, for the police to expand their military capabilities and for the military to also funnel uh, various types of weapons and other, uh, and other methods to domestic police. So 
Here we have got an example up here about the, uh, the prevalence or worry about war on drugs in the United States. So in the 1960s, you have very few people who are worried about drugs in their community. They don't think it's a very big deal. By 1989, people, 40% of people polled think that drugs are the primary problem facing their community. And by the time you get to the 1990s, 71% of adults are thinking that uh, the government is spending too little to counteract the drug problem. So drugs are seen as a primary driver of crime and school violence. And most Americans, when surveyed, supported the use of the military to engage in drug interdiction policies. So again, link this back up to the two things that we talked about earlier, the economics of crisis and the economics of bureaucracy. So what does the war on drugs give us an opportunity to do? So we have the government that's like going along, it's expanding, war on drugs. People are scared, they freak out about drugs, they want the government to do something. And the government does something. Same thing with the war on terror. So if you actually look at what happens with opinion polls like I have up here, over time people stop caring a lot um, about drugs. And if you look at people's opinions about whether or not drugs are a particularly uh, important issue, the numbers go something like this. So they start off and they're really high, and then they very quickly go down. However, what's interesting is what's happening simultaneously. So if you ask the same question, but if instead of drugs, you put in the word terrorism, right about the time that people stop getting really worried about drugs, they start getting really worried about terrorism. And then you wind up combining those two things together. So if you remember when we talked about crisis, one of the important things was this idea of retrenchment, that after the crisis abates, the government does drop its activity to some degree. But what's important, in addition to this domestic component about the war on drugs and the war on terror, which allows us to have this internal focus on police and military within the US, what this also tells us is that we then have a perpetual crisis. So what happens if you have this war on drugs, you have a drug crisis, if you have a terror crisis, and these crises never end, what does that imply for policy in general, but specifically for uh, police militarization? So as a result of these crises, and as a result of the incentives facing law enforcement and the military, we start to see this rapid acceleration of police militarization. So in the 1980s, in 1981, we see the Military Cooperation with Law Enforcement Act. And what this act does, it really plays into what we were talking about earlier about the economics of bureaucracy. How groups, when they are trying to expand their budget, to expand their personnel, they're going to try to take on other activities which will get them a bigger budget and more people. In the case of the war on drugs and the war on terror, this means that state and local police and the military have an incentive to do what? They have an incentive to engage in counter drug activity. They have an incentive to engage in counter terrorism policy. Because by doing that, they can signal to the larger government apparatus that what they are doing is particularly important. And specifically, that then they deserve or they need more people, more funding, et cetera. And we start to see that these things come together. So again, you have the have kind of like the convergence of the war on drugs and the war on terror. And you've also got um, in the military who recognizing these opportunities to expand start working with each other. Because, hey, you're trying to expand, I'm trying to expand, and we both figure out that we can expand if we work on these counter-drug and counter-terrorism policies. So the Military Cooperation with Law Enforcement Act is really the first thing that we see in this uh, cooperation against, uh, against drugs and later terror. Uh, so it's created to, it created several more exceptions to the Posse Comitatus Act. So as if it wasn't uh, dead enough already, um, it's really dead now. And the idea behind this law is that it would enhance 
and that's a, that's a direct quote from the legislation, it would enhance the ability of federal and domestic law enforcement to enact drug policies. And specifically what this act allowed was for the military and the federal government and state and local law enforcement agencies to do things like share information with each other. And it also allowed the Department of Defense to transfer and maintain equipment for domestic law enforcement agencies. So now we start to see not only are they able to share information and tactics with each other, but now they are also actually able to share um, to share weapons. The yeah. Uh, civil forfeiture is definitely a big component of this as well. That I think we can mostly talk about related to the war on drugs. So for those of you who may not be familiar, asset forfeiture is um, basically the idea that if you're caught doing something, or in some cases if your property is being used to do something illegal, then the government can confiscate your property. It's absolutely a component of this. We can talk about more that during the Q&A if you want, but good question. So the result of this military cooperation with Law Enforcement Act is almost immediate. So remember, this is passed in 1981. And within the first couple years after its passing, the Department of Defense granted about uh, 10,000 requests from state and local law enforcement to assist in civil rights activities. In 1983, so this is two years after the act is passed before it really gets, uh, gets into effect. Fewer than 1,000 military aircraft are providing local authorities with about 3,000 hours annually of aerial surveillance. By 1984, we have 3,000 military aircraft that are now providing forces with about 10,000 hours of military surveillance. So we see very quickly how these programs um, allowed for the expansion of a, lot of, uh, of a lot of activity by the local police. And then we come to program 1033, which if you all kept up with uh, Ferguson, you may have actually heard about this program. So program 1033 is a Department of Defense program which allows for the US military to transfer excess military equipment to state and local law enforcement agencies. And even though it's gotten a lot of attention recently, it was actually started in 1997. So we had the Military Cooperation with Law Enforcement Act that allowed for this information transfer and allowed for this uh, weapons transfer. And what Program 1033 uh, was effectively able to do was expand that, and it expanded it uh, exponentially. So what kinds of things can the police get from program 1033? Uh, things like aircraft, armored vehicles, weapons, riot gear, watercraft, and surveillance equipment. Uh, my favorite story, which I tried to look up this morning and couldn't find my original link, is from a small town out west who is able to acquire a military submarine, but true story, they actually don't have a body of water deep enough to submerge the submarine. Um, but you know, gonna have your toys. And it's not just like state police departments, so I'm from Louisville, Kentucky, it's a city of about a million people if you take the entire metro area. It's not just fairly large, uh, large towns or moderately sized towns that are doing this. Um, actually, there are a lot of uh, school police departments who are taking advantage of this program. Now, I don't want to make it sound like that every campus is getting, uh, you know, AK-47s. Um, I actually looked before I came, couldn't find anything from uh, Metro State, but. There are some other things that they can get. So again, some of these items are fairly innocuous. So things like typewriters. I didn't know they still made them, but apparently you can get them, and the military will give you one if you're a police department and you apply for it. First aid kits, all right? Don't see anything too, uh, too, too weird there. Fireman pants, um, not clear if fireman is included. Um, I don't think so, but uh, fire pants and other fire equipment. 
And then we start getting to some things where you have to go like, wait a second, because typewriters and first aid kits, fireman pants, and then you start to get to play that game of one of these things is not like the other things. AK-47s, for example. Grenade launchers. These are all going to campus police departments. And armored vehicles, mine resistant armored vehicles. Uh, this one I think in particular is uh, referred to as the Bearcat, actually stands for something. You can go and YouTube the video where they're, um, it's actually the sales video for it. It's pretty funny, you might like it. Um, and I think it was Ohio State that actually came under a lot of scrutiny after purchasing uh, or acquiring one of these vehicles from the US military and when asked why they needed it, they responded that they needed it for football games and quote, crowd control. So this is what we kind of have come to up to the present, is we've gotten Program 1033, the Military Cooperation with Law Enforcement Act, and this really long history of the police and military distinction eroding, and police taking on more and more military uh, types of characteristics. So we can see then, and I'm often asked when talking about this topic, well, what do you think is gonna happen in the future? And I think it's likely that this kind of thing is going to be perpetuated. Why is it going to be perpetuated? It goes back to the very things that we talked about earlier. Economics of crisis, the economics of bureaucracy. People are going to freak out about things. So now it's Ebola. We're deploying the military to combat Ebola. Talking about things like quarantines and things like that. There's always gonna be some kind of crisis. And we see now, the, I said again, the police and the National Guard are being used to combat Ebola. So we're still seeing this kind of perpetuation. And we can also consider the role of um, special interest groups. My friend up in the front here mentioned asset forfeiture. There are lots of groups who have a vested interest in keeping the war on drugs and the war on terror going, whether or not it's particularly effective or uh, cost, in terms of cost or in terms of efficacy. So there's the role of special interest groups to consider, which we can talk about more um, if you want. And then we also have uh, what's occurring with the 1033 program, which is this uh, use it or lose it idea. So not only do it, does this program say, okay, we'll give you these weapons or you can apply and you can buy them at a discounted rate or we'll give them to you, is that under the program statutes, if these types of things are not used within a certain period of time, I think it's a year, then they're technically supposed to be returned to the Department of Defense. So now what kind of incentive does that create? So we're going to give you this massive mine resistant armored vehicle and we're going to tell you that if you don't use it within a year, then you're going to have to give it back. So what, again, what kind of incentive does that create? Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure if they've upped the time. The last time I checked it was a year, but it could be a little bit longer than I haven't seen a, uh, the question is, is there a certain number of times that they have to use it? I don't think that it's a discrete, like you have to use it five times. Um, I could be wrong about that though, so. Um, but there's definitely an incentive where you're supposed to you, you have to use it. So here are a couple specific examples of this use it or lose it uh, kind of idea. So this one comes from Keene, New Hampshire, and it's, they got a $285,000 grant to get one of those um, mine resistant armored vehicles to get one of those Bearcats I was talking about earlier. So they got this big grant, over a quarter of a million dollars, to buy an armored car. And they have used this as of 20, um, up to 2013, 21 times. Now, what was this armored vehicle actually used for? The town is very, very small. So it's not a big group of people. They've used it uh, 19 times in training exercises, once when a person decided to barricade themselves in the house, and another time when a person was threatening suicide. So you have a person who is threatening to kill themselves and they send out the SWAT team in their fully armored vehicle. 
That's the kind of incentive that this creates. You've also got uh, Columbia, South Carolina. They've acquired a variety of these different kinds of military vehicles, uh, including one that can be mounted with a 50 caliber machine gun. Um, this is also, I think, known as the, it's like the most, uh, I think it's like the most uh, collegial or friendly town in the South. So um, we can debate about that <laughs> if we want. So it's kind of, a, we're coming to the end of our time and I wanna make sure that we have enough time for questions. And to talk a little bit about like a re, just a recap very quickly and to talk about um, a conclusion and to see really if police can be demilitarized. So we've seen this convergence between police and military over time, but is there a way, if we go all the way back to when we talked about the paradox of government, if we have enabled police to take on these kinds of military tactics, if we've enabled police to act as a military force, is there any way to reconstrain them now that the genie's been let out of the bottle, so to speak? And I'm curious if anybody else has, um, has thoughts on this, because it doesn't seem that there is any really obvious, permanent solution to the problem. And again, this goes back to what we discussed and what we have discussed with the idea of the economics of bureaucracy. It's a fundamental institutional issue. It's a structural issue of government that presents the opportunity and the incentives for this kind of activity to continue and to perpetuate. And again, as I mentioned a few moments ago, it also seems likely that this convergence between police and military will continue. Again, link this back to the economics of bureaucracy. We talked about uh, the current Ebola crisis. So even if you assume that there are no more crises, so if all of the crises magically ended tomorrow, would police and the military want to give up the kinds of things that they have already acquired? The answer is no. And again, it goes back to what we talked about. If you can do more with less, then what happens? Your budget gets cut, you lay people off, and that's unpopular. It also seems unclear to how to reestablish this distinction between police and military. I think that at a minimum, it requires a massive shift in public opinion regarding the kinds of functions that the police and the military are supposed to engage in. Uh, I think this assumption in itself is fairly heroic. Um, if you ask people whether or not you know, police should be able to uh, have high grade like military weapons, they typically will bring up situations like, well, you know, what if, again, we have like another Boston bombing? Like what happens? Like don't you want the police to be like equipped to deal with things? Like you don't want you know, the bad guys to have better guns than the police do and you encounter kinds of arguments like that. So not only do you have that, but even if you get a massive shift in public opinion, then you have to confront this massive complex of drug policies and terrorism policies, which then falls prey again to this idea of economics of bureaucracy, special interest groups, and a variety of other issues. So with that, I'm about to the end of my time, and I think we have about 15 minutes or so for questions, and so I am happy to um, clarify anything or to um, answer any questions that you all may have, and I hope that this has been informative and uh, enjoyable, and uh, thank you. they could either regulate it, um, or I think that probably the better answer to that question is that people have a tendency to be very creative. So you're starting to see a move toward things like uh, electric and hybrid cars, and so I think that it may actually not be a crisis that will come to pass.